Hi, welcome everyone to this uh, Contracts 101 seminar. This one will be on e-publishing, so if you're not here for e-publishing, you're in the wrong place. Uh, my name is Terry Stratton. I'm Director of Education and Outreach here at the Guild, and I'm happy to see so many familiar faces and new faces. Thank you, my mother's watching, so she's <laughs> Let me just remind you to please turn off your cell phones. Oh. Um, please, no pictures, no posting on Facebook during the event. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the evening, so hold your questions until the end. Uh, if I do call on you for a question, please stand up and ask it so that our internet and our audio recording audience can hear the question. <coughs> Um, I'll be sitting outside, actually, to let the latecomers in to disrupt people as little as possible. So without any further ado, I'm very happy to introduce Rob Sevish, our Executive Director of Business Affairs. Thank you, Terry. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I just wanted to welcome you here and welcome this estimable collection of talent up here and uh, tell you that e-publishing, like a lot of other issues, are, is an issue of concern to the Drama's Guild Council. We'd like to develop more information about it so that we can help you think more clearly about it and have as much information as possible. And that's the reason for tonight's seminar, so that we can gather the information with you. Um, we've given you some materials for, for that end, and we're hoping that this panel can generate some more conversation, some more ideas, and some more thoughts about it. So I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of our Director of Business Affairs, David Sully. Thank you, Dennis. Just some quick housekeeping. If you're watching online, if you're watching the live stream, we are going to be referring to some sample contracts and some sample uh, handouts that we gave out. They are available at www.dramatistguild.com uh, forward slash business affairs or on the Dramatist Guild Facebook page. So, dramatistguild.com, business affairs, or the Facebook page for the, for the Dramatist Guild. Uh, and I have uh, one of the, probably, this is one of the best panels I've been on, and I've met David Nimmer, who, who's a Nimmer on copyright. That's right, Nimmer on copyright. And so I'll just go down the line and introduce everybody. This is Jonathan Loma, he's an agent with WME. Uh, this is Ken Dingledy, he's with. Uh, Samuel French Publishing, Arthur Kopitz, Jeff Sweet, and there's Michael Thomas from Drama Display Service, and Tom Chelberg from Cowan Leibowitz Lotman. And you can um, read their full bios. Super impressive panel. You're all very lucky to be seeing this tonight. Um, and I can tell you from my point of view, I'm excited about this subject in particular. Very lively, very timely subject. There's a lot of what I hear when I'm at the Business Affairs Hotline. People are calling me saying, what are the standards? I, I just wrote a musical. We get two, two, and two, right? Or, you know, what's my royalty? What, what subrights do I give? They want subrights. What do I give? Well, these, these aren't questions that have a, a steady answer independent of your situation. These are all interrelated uh, uh, issues. Uh, just like, how much do you get for a commission. Well, if you don't write the play, you don't get anything, right? <laughs> you have to write the play and then you get something. And if I write a play, I get a lot less than if Jeff or Arthur write a play. Uh, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of give and take in these things. And this is a unique opportunity because all of these contractual provisions, whether you're talking about billing, uh, royalties, advances, subsidiary rights, uh, publishing rights, future options, all of these provisions at one time, they did not exist. They had to be born. Uh, and you, know, you can learn a lot about something by, generally by watching something of this type being born. For example, you can, uh, astronomers learn more about stars and celestial bodies by watching stars and solar systems being born. Biologists learn a lot by just watching different kinds of biological creatures being born. So when you're, as we're going through the discussion tonight, I want you to keep that in mind because you're, with electronic publishing, you're watching contractual provisions being born. And this can inform your knowledge on any contractual provision. 
uh, when you're negotiating anything. No term, no provision exists in a, in a vacuum. All contractual provisions are subject to evolution, and all of them had to be born. So starting with that, I wanted to uh, address uh, Arthur and Jeff and ask, in terms of this, these new issues being born that are coming into author's contracts of e-publishing, how did um, how did this start becoming an issue for you two? Yeah. are impossible to correct, and can make <coughs> amendments which are impossible to make now because you just get addenda and nobody can write them all in and they're not done. So you have an acting edition which is not your play. Uh, the ability to see your play performed or musical performed and be able to realize, oh, wait a minute, I can cut this scene if you want, and be able to inform uh, the uh, your publishing house um, that I would like to add an addendum which says if this happens this circumstance the director can cut this or move this or if you have this possibility so it enables the author to continue to learn from his or her play which is what we do all the time this is a huge change and for that alone to be able to publish on demand whether the acting edition is printed out or you know, Jeff says that actors are going to use their iPads. I can't imagine that, but maybe they will. Um, but being able to have the theater have the updated version uh, and to know that a new version is out uh, and, and in a sense communicate with the author is, is a great advantage. The potential disadvantages my colleague Jeff can talk about. <laughs> um, I can talk about some of the advantages and the disadvantages. This arose for me because I got uh, started getting uh, uh, letters from my uh, from my publishers. I've got plays published by Samuel French, Dramas Play Service, Play Scripts, Northwestern University Press, and um, um, somebody else. MTI. I don't know. I've got a lot of different things, and, and I'm starting to get notices about you know, can you please sign this writer so that we can make something available. Uh, uh, electronically. Well, I don't want to sign a writer yet until it's all been shaken out, until I know what, if there are industry standards of some sort, that, that, that there's, uh, uh, what my rights are, what their rights are. I also don't want to sign a writer if it means, for instance, here's one thing that's an un unintended consequence. I've got an anthology of plays that's published by uh, Northwestern University Press. If they put out an edition, why on earth would an acting edition be, uh, why should somebody have an acting edition of the same play? Or if their acting editions are coming out, why would anybody ever produce, uh, you know, in, the, in an e version? Why would anybody ever come out with a library edition of an anthology of plays again? Now, so that has to be shaken out. Uh, another thing is um, something that Arthur talked about, which is terribly exciting, is that there's sometimes not just one version of a play. For instance, uh, A.R. Gurney wrote a play called Sylvia, and there's one scene in which the language is very rough. And there are people who wanted to, uh, do, to do the play, but the one scene in the park is a very a hard scene for, for certain audience. So he wrote a, uh, he wrote a, a GP version uh, of that, or is it PG? I don't know. Uh, general practitioner version. Uh, so anyway, uh, this gives him the opportunity, this gives him the opportunity to, uh, to oh, you want to license the, uh, the PG version. Or uh, there are different versions of, let's say, Greece now out. There's, uh, the, there's the version that we know that's on Broadway, there's a the version that was the original version that was done in Chicago, which is much rougher, which was just revived in Chicago, and some people want to do the rough version. And then there's a the version that's suitable for high schools. So you, you have all of these things, plus something that Arthur and I are both interested in is the idea of this opens up the possibility of FAQs. If you're having production after production of the same play, the same questions are going to keep coming up, and people keep asking you uh, questions about about the play. Well, why why have to crank out the same answers to the same questions? Why not be able to post online, you know, this kind of, this school asked me about this, or this theater asked me about that, 
and build up a body of FAQs, answers to questions. No, you may not take an intermission now, for instance. Uh, stuff, stuff like that. So we have all sorts of uh, interesting issues. Here. Arthur says he doubts that uh, the actors are going to be carrying iPads in there, so I don't doubt it at all. The question is how are they are. Uh, the question is how will they make how will they make notes in in those traditions and, 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 and still keep everybody on the same page as they're in rehearsal. I don't know if the technology is here for people to put those kinds of notes in the end. Yeah. So but but then if you add, if when one actor adds something in notes, is that gonna make the page longer, which means that the you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we've got all sorts of standardization, which is good, which has got to kick in. I don't think that it makes any sense for each house to have their own standards, because it means that actors and writers would, would have to adjust to different standards at every house. You know, mm -hmm. it's like uh, all all websites are done on HTML, there's standardized language there. I don't see why there should be. Anyway, so these are some of the issues that uh, uh, that uh, came up. The other question is, I'm getting a new program from a new edition of WordPerfect 6, which has as one of its features the ability to instantly convert to something which can be uploaded to Amazon and sold on the Kindle. You know, if I know how to market, why on earth do I need a publisher if I, if, if I can, uh, if I, now uh, I, I gather there are reasons why I would need a publisher, but uh, if, if, if my word processing program is going to give me uh, perfectly adequate uh, uh, material to be able to upload to Amazon and I could collect the entire royalty, you know, what what are the publishing uh, what are the publishing houses going to give me that I that I can't get on my own? Well, let's talk to Ken and Michael about. Uh, you brought up two concerns. One is the acting versus trade editions, mm -hmm. and the other one is why not self-publish? And mm -hmm. uh, I never thought I'd say this, but the acting versus trade edition is actually the easier problem. It would seem. <laughs> uh, do you guys have thoughts on that? This is, this must have. Come, come to the fore in your respective companies already. Sure, um, Michael. <coughs> let's make a few distinctions. First of all, between a digital file and an ebook, there are standards in ebooks, and they're different based on the distribution platform. So, if you're on Amazon, you have the Mobi, Mobi format. If you're on Barnes and Noble, you have the EPUB format, and the EPUB format is the digital standard for ebooks. It's the open source digital standard. So, and I also want to add another twist on that, which is digital rights management, DRM. So DRM is applied on top of an EPUB format to protect the play from being distributed freely. Mm -hmm. So it's not the same thing as like a PDF. You don't, and there's no bilateral communication. So the, the idea that you can, for example, make a change and have it instantly proliferate around the world doesn't exist. It's, it's much more similar to buying an acting edition and then you have the acting edition, and then that's when the download ends. So if you make changes to an EPUB, somebody would have to go and re-download it again or repurchase the EPUB again. So it's, it's not, yeah. Uh, it's, sure. It, it, it isn't that you, you haven't downloaded it, but if you are downloading the current version of this play, or you are getting it as print on demand, and now there are changes to it, then the current version is now an updated version, and why is that not possible to be published either on demand or to be available to a theater to download it on their iPad? It is possible. The problem that, that sometimes occurs is that certain members of a, of a troop will download one version and then you update it and then other members get the other version and now you have mismatched versions. Sure, well, then, pretty easy. Then, then, you, then, you, then you have the Indians 2.3, Indians yeah. 2. Point, yeah. 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 But they have to purchase it. That's, that's they would have to purchase yeah. the new version unless they bought a license which you them buy to a that. ten year subscription to that play and you are able get to get the technology for that doesn't exist. Yet. Well this, this is a there. reason that playwrights will be very hesitant mm -hmm. to sign anything that commits them down the line because for me at least the only real advantage is to be able to update your plays and go back and correct mistakes that are in the acting editions of my plays. Now. No, that, that, that ability exists. I'm just trying to add some complexity to it. It's not a bilateral communication thing. You can't make an update and just immediately have it. Oh, no, 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 no. That, 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 that I understand. Somebody has it. And if I want to get a script from you, no. and I sign a contract, I want the, the current version. No. 
I could possibly say, could I see the previous version too? I mean, could I choose which they are or what you've got? You're dealing with the author, but it's there and you've controlled it and it's no more costly to send version 5.4 than 5.3 or 5.2. You have these versions. This is the version, this is the public domain, this is the, the, the parental control well, version. So let, let, let me qualify that again. Why would you assume it's no more costly? In other words, every time you have a transaction, there's a cost involved. Every time you convert a EPUB to a different, to a, when you make revisions to a EPUB, it's the same thing as making revisions to a clip. You're not producing books and inventory, physical inventory, but the same work goes into it. So there are costs involved. Well, it's, 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 it's a minimal cost because what you're doing is electronically there is a change to the script. There is there is the script. And the advantage to, to the authors and the advantage to producing organizations, they can get the current version. So while it would cost something, everything costs something, it costs something to get down here by subway. <coughs> but it's minimal compared to we haven't found that hiring a horse to drink. We haven't it. found that to be true so far. I, I, I tend to Ken, what's, yeah, what's your experience? Yeah, with, well, uh, that will be a major problem. play at Apple, right? And well, it, I mean, uh, I think the flexibility issue, which I think is where you're, you're saying here, is something I, I'd like to just draw a distinction. The world of even printing print books nowadays is not the world of Oh my God, we got to print 5,000 copies. We put it up on some shelf in a warehouse and it's going to take 20 years to work from it. And you can't make a change to it for yeah. that, right? right? Okay, that's gone. Right. The days of that in the print world are gone. Okay, so, so there's actually, from our perspective, um, whether it be print on demand or whether it be an EPUB, it's, it's now a much more flexible file. So our, our goal is that they match, right? We, we don't, you, you get on and you buy a print book, it needs to match the ebook version, right? There is the current version of the play. So, absolutely, in theory, because there is no tangible property, it, it's, it's an easier update, but quite frankly, it's the same as updating the print book for us nowadays. In other words, it's, you want to update it? Absolutely. We, I, I can't tell you how many in revision titles we have right now because authors are like, oh my God, I just want to fix the scene. I finally know what to do. And so, great. You know, so, that's we're, we've opened the gates on that. It's a different world. Um, the, what else? I'm sorry. I, I, where do we want to go now? The, 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 the thing that occurs to me is, I mean, is when I buy software, if there's a new version of the software that's going to be issued, there's something within the software that says, hey, there's a new version. Do you want to update? Your license says that you can have three updates, and I have updates. I don't see why, if one is able to similarly download a script and there's a new version, that the notice wouldn't go to the Great. purchasers. And Great. Update. What you're asking for, I think, is a subscription-based reading service, is what you're asking for. What this is, and, and, and what Michael is, is aptly <coughs> describing, is these are actual products that someone downloads, keeps on their device, and, and there's no more interaction. And this is just the way it's set up. This is, yeah. I mean, Random House and Stephen King, and, and this is the way it's, this is the way it is, okay? Yeah. So, so that model is a very interesting model. I couldn't agree with you more in terms of this subscription open kind of yeah, You thing. subscribe to the yeah. play, and, and when there's can, a new version, you, you're instantly notified, you can a, download it. A traditional ebook is not that. A traditional ebook is a product you <coughs> bought, and it's not gonna change until you buy the new version. Um, the mm, great. Well, I've, I've read Jonathan Lomo's some of his uh, uh, list of clients, so I know you have the power to make the future. <laughs> uh, so, what kind of you know, given these these kinds of tensions and some of the things that you probably have to negotiate? Again, we didn't quite address the trade versus acting editions or the self-publishing <coughs> issues. Uh, obviously, self-publishing would present a problem for for not only the publishers, but agents, because you'd be re relying essentially on an honor code at best, if you were included. Well, someone would so still like, have to negotiate you know, the deal between the client and, say, Apple. So right. we, we wouldn't be the ones out in the cold, but we need the publisher. Yeah. I mean, people often say, well, why can't, you know, why can't the clients just talk directly to Apple? And the reason is that we need two things. The client needs two things from the publisher. They need the promotion that the publisher uh, invests in, mm -hmm. does heavily, uh, to sell the book. Um, advertising it, and what they need is uh, the trade edition. And the publisher is, um, you know, we're getting to a place where there's like, you know, between a dozen and two dozen authors who can still get a trade edition book. And in a way, it's the payment for giving over the e-rights. 
because they've got to be sold now as a bundle. You know, you're going to only dispose of both things. A, a publisher is never going to say, "Fine, we'll run your <coughs> anthology," but we don't need. You don't want to give those e-rights. That's fine. And for by the way, for years we were able to say to publishers, we were able to hold them off and say, "We're not giving e-rights." It's it's a, it's a outre, it's a strange part of the business, it's not important, and we could, we could get rid of that easily. Yeah. But now it's such a substantial amount of what they sell uh, that we have, to, we have to give it. Did you say that e-publishing, elec the electronic publishing rights, were something the author would, is, in your experience, willing to give in exchange for still having a print book? Yeah, because, because for many of my authors, the most important thing is that book on the shelf. To be able to walk into uh, the drama bookshop see an anthology of their plays, you know, uh, or, or their latest play that they had on Broadway. That's still very important to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to be very hard for a publisher it's to put that out without the ebook book. It's important because, as Arthur says, actors are still going to have to rely on hard copies. Mm -hmm. It has a certain accessibility that hasn't been replaced yet. Or it's important because that's the way we grew up. And that's how we measure the accomplishments. I'd, I'd be speculating. But I think that there is an emotional feeling mm -hmm. that one has seeing their work of art in concrete form mm -hmm. available to people. And when we talk about a, a work of art created by pixels and dots, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have the same feeling. Now, in the pocketbook, of course, it's going to be more important because you know you talk to the next generation of kids coming up, and they don't care about their collection on the shelf. Mm -hmm. You know that that was how we defined ourselves. This is who I am. <coughs> Look, I've curated this collection of books, this set of albums. This is who I am. They don't care about that. They don't care about having anything. It's why would you ever go back to something? You know, you're going to pay twenty four dollars for something that you only might read. You're almost certainly never going to go back to it. I'm talking about a hardcover book. Yeah. And uh, it's going to take up space when you're done. <laughs> we weigh that against having this thing in your device. And by the way, you could have the library of Alexandria in that one yeah. device <laughs> and never have to worry about anything else. Yeah. Um, and that's where that's the, that's where we're going. We're going we're, we're going to a, a, a bookless world. And increasingly, we're going to be storing the stuff that we buy in, in the cloud, so we don't even have to keep <laughs> it on our own. We just, uh, so wherever we have Wi-Fi, oh, I want to read this, I've already bought it, Ooh, it's there, I'm getting it. And so we don't even have physical possession of works of art anymore. Yeah, okay. Can I, can yeah. Quick clarification. Would, would someone um, agrees to produce, they want to produce uh, a play that you are um, controlling, uh, it's not an amateur. When they get the uh, electronic version, are they downloading it and also getting an acting edition bound copy, or is it just electronic and do they print it out for themselves? If they want to do the old fashioned way and hold the script in hand, what do they get? There is no requirement for them to buy a physical copy. Right now, there, there's the, there are, um, <clears throat> going down the road, we may experiment with bundling where you get the e version and the print version. You know, we can, we can exp experiment with that. But right now, um, we're seeing the ebooks are being bought to peruse. And then once you actually get cast in the show and you do it, then you buy a print copy as well to hold on stage and highlight the lines. Again, that's coming to be able to read off of a digital reader. It's just not there yet. And I think you know, years from now, it, it, it will be much more common. Again, I have been in the classroom, and I have seen a uh, high school student do an entire Shakespeare piece from their iPhone. So it, it, it can happen. It's just right now what we're seeing is it's approval versus there still need, majority need the hard copy. I wanted to ask Tom, uh, you have, from your perspective, you probably see how these new copyrights are being spliced up, these new ways of, of thinly splicing copyright are being, are developing. Cloud, e-publishing, that's probably going to be a differentiation. Uh, can, you, can you speak to that a little bit about what your clients are dealing with? Well, everybody's dealing with the, you know, with the question of, uh, you know, electronic rights and, and, you know, how that's, how that's going to be handled. I have not, I have to say that this, the, the reluctance to get into electronic uh, publishing that I can hear expressed here is uh, not my general experience in, in general book publishing. <coughs> where it's pretty much been embraced. It's, it, at, at worst, it's a necessary evil. Uh, now there may be some real, you know, unintended consequences, of, you know, as as, uh, as has been mentioned, that uh, we are, you know, getting into a, a world where, you know, we may be letting, you know, the genie out of the bottle, or you know, Pandora's, you know, box may be opening up 
in terms of getting our stuff out there uh, and out of our control. You know, that, and of course the question, you know, that's often posed rhetorically is the book publishing industry, you know, in a position analogous to that of the record business in about 1995, mm -hmm. you know, and are we going to drive off is that it? cliff by, I, I think not. I, I think that, uh, <coughs> that the, uh, first of all, you know, we've had the opportunity to learn from the mistakes <laughs> of, the, of the record business. Also, you know, what, what was mentioned over in the green room, that, that the fact that the law is always behind the technology, uh, and, you know, or the more positive way of looking at it is that it's constantly adapting to new technology. You know, until there was a printing press who needed copyright law at all. <laughs> You know, until there were mass media who needed a right of publicity. You know, it, it, it was really a, a you know it would be a right that nobody could exploit. But uh, I think the law has has been you know catching up. You know, remedies uh, it, and and also, you know, the the uh, the uh, Apple experience. You know, the fact that Apple is now the most profitable you know company in the world. And a lot of that is from selling digital music files. You know, that was all about legally, legally giving yeah. people a you know, legal avenue, finding it, finding, finding, you know, uh, a price that people were willing to pay rather than steal it, uh, make it convenient enough that people will pay the ninety-nine cents or the eighty-nine cents rather than steal it, and uh, then you can you can do good business. Yeah. I was going to say my, my reluctance, though, which you find. Surprised by part of my reluctance is, is reflected in uh, what I see here as current e publishing terms, which is that the terms are varying from house to house. Uh -huh. uh, Sam French is, according to this, offered us 25% of all. That's only that's all negotiable. Okay, and then they draw this place. Okay. Says, that's, whoa, whoa. Yeah, that's what they're going to start with when they call you on the phone. Yeah, Jonathan, it's negotiable to the to, to Jeff and Arthur. Because we're it's not negotiable to the other <laughs> six thousand members of the guild. Well, it's twenty percent for some of them. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I don't mean that as a slam against. Well, against if, you know, if, if, if you're asking, is publishing going to be a buyer's market? Yes, there's always going to be a buyer's market. But if you have something that someone wants, mm -hmm. you can test that market and you can you can move these numbers around. Uh, if if someone really doesn't want what you have. It's better you know that before they buy it and don't sell it. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur, yes. I, 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 want to, I, I want to mention what I think is one of the legal reasons why an author, even if you can self-publish, wants Sam and French DPS and TI or whoever. And it has to do with police. Yeah. You self-publish your own play. Anyone gets it and they're doing it, you don't know. Now, Sam and French and DPS and Thomas Pulsar, are not going out and monitoring every production. But, and I hope it's not just an illusion, but if, and there are actors who love writers and will let you know that if there is a production that is done in a university or, or a theater, they're charging admission, and they don't have the rights, they've just taken an addition. I like to believe that the that you are never going to be get another Samuel French play, you're not going to get a DPS play, and so that ability to make sure that the play is done and you charge admission and you're paying a royalty is an essential aspect of, of that. We need them to buy the book too. <laughs> you know, quite frankly, we need them to pay the licensing fee too. So absolutely. This is why BMI and ASCAP, why they are able to do yep. that. You, if you, if you try to get around this, you, you may get away with it, but you can be in a lot of, a lot of trouble. Uh, Michael and then Jonathan. Yeah. One, of the, one of the things as a quarter we were saying, Arthur, is that we run very regular reports, usually over the week, uh, once a month more often, uh, which check all cast size orders of scripts and see who cross reference the licenses. So if there aren't, uh, uh, if there's a cast size order and there's no license, we go after them immediately. So this actually with ePlays makes it easier because it, everything's digital, it's already instantly recorded. So it makes it even easier for us when there's a cast size order of digital plays to go after and find out if they've uh, secured a license or not. When this first came up in the theater world in the last two or three years, um, the reluctance was based on the idea that, you know, what if what playwrights wrote, what you know, the sweat of their brow became worthless in the cloud, that 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 there'd be <coughs> sacrificial cows, that this first generation of playwrights would be like Edgar Allan Poe, who died a pauper, <coughs> even though he had, was a bestseller in France because the copyright laws hadn't caught up and wasn't getting royalties, but the people, mm -hmm. you know, ten years later were all fine. That was the concern, and it was expressed in two ways. The first is that. 
you have un more unauthorized productions because you know if somebody calls Samuel French and buys 26 copies of The Great White Hope, you say to yourself, well, what's the cast size of The Great White Hope? I think it's 26. Well, we better we better check on this and get our license. So that that was the first thing, and the second thing was printed copies. You know, uh, what if somebody buys you know. Um, leave you out, uh, a, a, a one copy of Robert Sherwood's Idiot's Delight, which I think you guys sell. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next thing you know, they print out 25 copies. They've essentially stolen 25 scripts for the, for the, for the cast members. And um, I think we're convinced now that both of those things have been solved and that the Kindle traps mm -hmm. the e-book in itself. You can't print out from the Kindle. And you're not going to be giving your Kindle away. And if you I mean, it's just cost-benefit analysis, you're not going to be doing that. And uh, although... Uh, BPP is a problem because I think they sell a PDF. So, yeah. That's a problem. Um, and the other thing is, is that the internet, the technology that sort of gave people the ability to have, you know, the 13 Kindles uh, by different addresses. I didn't know you could track it, but the internet gave us the ability to Google search the title of a play, and all you need is one person putting it in their church flyer that's online, and you know if you've got an unauthorized production. So the two things that were the biggest thing in the agent's mind for not doing this, the unauthorized productions and the scripts printed uh, ad infinitum, both of those seem to have been surmounted, and, and with, with that, we can erase it. As long as you have a unique enough title to put into the search engine, I've, I've, I've run down a few unauthorized, including a production in Germany that I was able to get dough from. But, yeah. Ken, Ken and Michael, are you guys comfortable of this switch to uh, being uh, businesses that will publicize and police? Well, I mean, it, policing has, has been easier for you in the past, I think, than it, than it is now. Well, I, I, would, I would say it's just the opposite, actually. It's, um, With the search engines, it's easier for police? Well, first, let me say that it's surprising how honest uh, theater producers are. Most theater producers uh, want to secure the rights and pay for the rights. There are a couple of bad apples out there, and um, frequently somebody who's disgruntled in a cast will report them to us. So, as Arthur said, there's, there's people policing on our side. So there's people, who, there's actors who, who like authors, yeah. and there's actors who hate their producers. Either, <laughs> either one works for us. Either one. Yeah. Someone always didn't get cast. Yeah. <laughs> and the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's right. <laughs> So, so in addition to that, um, you know, our ability to run reports off all this digital data is much easier than it was in the past when everything was on paper and uh, you were writing down orders on paper and filling orders off by paper. Now everything can be queried through databases and, uh, and we can create uh, reports in literally two, three seconds that used to take uh, a week to compile. So if like, you know, 12 people buy skin of our teeth, they're going to different Kindles. I mean, how, how do you? How can you see that? That's all. This, those are the okay, twelve, 12 people in the cast. I'll give you an example. Um, the play service will be launching the plays in probably early June, and um, one of the uh, apps we use is called Scene Partner. It's an iOS app, which is for um, Apple operating system, uh, uh, and uh, they have uh, the way they divide their customers is either by actor or theater. So a theater can sign up with Scene Partner. And then what they can do is purchase a cast size number of scripts, mm -hmm. which then they give their actors the password to, and, the, and then the actors can download the script. So whenever there's a theater purchase, we get a report that tells us that that purchase has been made, and we can make sure that they've secured a license. Mm -hmm. Now, just because they make a purchase doesn't mean they don't intend to secure a license. Sometimes they'll purchase in advance and then secure the license afterwards. So it's not always a matter of catching somebody. It's just a matter of reminding them. We know you bought these. You need to apply for a license if you intend to do the production. You're such a diplomat. <laughs> when they print out the version, they print it out on a hard copy. It's, it's, disab it's disabled to print it. Yeah. So it's, it's going to so so be on uh, the yeah. iPad. So how do they? They got to read it from the device. They either read it from the device or they buy the print edition if they get cast. Right. Okay. So when they're auditioning, they have it on the iPad. Sure. Mm -hmm. But then when they're cast and they're going to the rehearsal. Well, it would be up to them. Um, I just actually got an email yesterday from uh, a theater that wants to do their first production on the scene partner. So, and they want to do it all on iPads. So, um, people are transitioning to this new new way, and I think they're excited about it. They're actually excited about it. Maybe they break some of their iPads. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
tangible scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Apple mm -hmm. certainly mm -hmm. hopes so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in that situation, <laughs> could it be the producer or is, would the actor, this would be negotiated. There's an actor in production and he says, if I'm cast, I want to be able to hold my one scene in my hand or break my nose. Right, right, you, you, may have have a cast, you may have a cast that half of them want to use a print book sure. and half of them want to use a... I mean, ideally, it should be an option where you can... Uh, we sell both. Absolutely. I want to start getting down to some of the standards, and this is very lawyerly of me, very unartistic of me, uh, you know, because because that's people don't come to me for any artistic reasons. They only come to me for uh, the hard, cold hard facts. Um, uh, Tom, can you speak a little bit about what what are the standards for your basic novel? The, you, you you seem to have said that the, that your average book publishing uh, non non theater book publishing it's embraced the electronic world. Are there standards in terms of percentage? Uh, I, I assume it's worldwide. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, is the term in, well, I, in perpetuity? I, I, or? It's sort of bandied around that 25% uh, has become something of a standard. 25% of the publisher's gross, which would be you know after the 30% the commission if it's if it's <laughs> Pardon? Right. Maybe the, the net. net. Yeah. Well, well, what's it's something they're just gross, gross. Yeah. yeah, yeah, And and so so we're are we looking at the theater world approaching that model no. as well? Well, John, I, I be, oh. <laughs> well, I mean, look, it, we're, I'm going to take a very different position than than my friend to my left who has, <laughs> who has the worst deal of of, uh, of the people oh. here. Let me uh, just, that he I offered. Just add, I just want to add one thing, though. As, we'll as, get as, you you, over it. as you said earlier, you know, of course, you know, everything's you know subject to negotiation right. and, and leverage, and you know, if you're talking about you know John Grisham or if you're talking about you know me. <laughs> we're, right. we're not going to get the same terms. We want 50% of the publisher's net for the author. We want 50% of it. Is that what you're seeing? So, uh, I mean, it's, it's what we've been getting. We, we want that too. It's what we've author. been getting. So if you have 10, like, what, what, let's say that it's a $10 right. book. What let, this, let me clear about you can get that from trade publishers, right? I'm talking about, a, I'm talking about if you buy a script. Oh, this okay. is what we want. We want, uh, let's say it's $10. $3 goes to Apple off the top. And you got seven dollars left that goes back to the publisher. Now we want half that. We want that split 50-50. So basically, we want 35 percent of what you paid for the book to go to the author, which is an increase from the 10 percent that the author used to get uh, in retail yeah. publishing yeah. from from the sales price. But we think the increase is justified because the publisher, frankly, isn't doing that much anymore beyond the advertising and beyond doing the trade edition. They don't have any manufacturing costs. The publisher has no warehouse costs. As you, uh, as you, heard Mr. Dingleman say, they have, they have no, they have no shipping costs, and they have no returns. I mean, you can return the book, but there used to be a cost associated with returns, in that the publisher would destroy the book, which they don't have anymore. So it's essentially pure profit, and the 50-50 split comes from what we see in music publishing. And we think it should be in the author's pocket, not the publisher's. Yeah, a few years ago. Ten years ago, that that was a lot more common, say, in a trade book, you know, trade book contract with a with a you know smaller publisher and a less well known author. That you'd see that fifty percent, you know, rate for electronic. Yeah. Well, well, let's let's hold on. Let's, let's for some reason, on. I don't know why the publisher. He's offering is. forty, so he's almost there. Right? Uh, hold on, hold on. Let's let's get <laughs> that in, get the <laughs> no chance to <laughs> defend himself since he's here. <laughs> so no, I, I and then Michael. Thank you, thank you, uh, and I, I I totally hear it. I totally hear it. I get it. I hear it. I hear it. I hear it. Two things I'd like to just kind of couch the conversation with. Um, I think we have to look at the models here. Mm -hmm. DPS and Samuel French are taking two very different models right now. Yeah, we're we're taking a a retailer model where all of our distribution is through the Apple iBook Store. Uh, soon it will branch out into Kindle. Uh, it'll go into the Nook. These are major retailers that offer huge distribution and, and huge visibility for the author's work. Every retailer will, as you mentioned, take between 30 to 40 percent <coughs> of their retail cut, and that gets down to the publisher net, right? So that's, that's why the comparison, I, I know we want to compare between the models. It's not a comparable model. It's a different model. Well, DPS is doing theirs in-house, right? I understand. Yes. Yeah. 
I, how do you do that? I, I just, you, you've, got, you've got the neighbor's kid on a computer just, just pumping out the electronic? No, no it's, 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 it's the distribution yeah. model. It's, yeah. the, it's the distribution. Yeah. Yeah. I'm being facetious. I, no, know, no, no, I yeah. know that, you know. Yeah. No, I, so what, I, I want to come to Ken's defense as well. Yeah. They're, they're a very different model. Ken, Ken is, uh, Sam French is distributing through major retailers. The Play Service is distributing solely through our website and through um, uh, a few select third parties, such as Steam Parker, the iOS app. So it's a very different model. Um, Samuel French Plays, for example, will be available on uh, the Kindle eventually, and the Play Service Plays will not be available for the Kindle. So they're, they're, more of a, they're taking a very different approach. Well, then, then the question I was talking about, trade versus acting edition, is different depending on whether the play is published with French or with you. With you, it would make sense for uh, uh, for a play of mine that's published with the DBS to then be able to also sell a, 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 a trade edition through uh, electronic publishing. But there's not there isn't any reason to do it through Sandra French because you're going to be selling it through Kindle anyway. Well, it it, it also depends. I mean, as we move into this brave new world, it, it also depends on what you call an ebook. So, for example. Um, and I'll let Ken talk about French contracts, but in our contract, we're looking uh, solely for the acting edition, right? Essentially, it's an e-acting edition. We're not looking for an enhanced ebook, which might inclu include uh, audio or video or uh, interactivity of some kind. Maybe you have the FAQs that, that you were talking about directly on the book. Um, there's all kinds of possibilities where it becomes more of a multimedia experience. So. Um, that's not what the play service does. That's not our function. Our function is to provide a script and to license that play and collect licensing for the author and the agent on behalf of them. So that's our role, and, uh, and that's what we want to do. And if uh, a trade publisher wants to publish uh, a trade edition of their play, we have no problem with that. But the trade publisher might have a problem yeah. not having well, electronic they, rights. And, and, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they, they will, and they do. We've had those conversations with the trade publishers, yeah. and because How do we, those go? we would love, well, I mean, we would love nothing more for them to coexist. But yeah. I get it when you possibly we, we, they can. I hope, I think. But like in the iBook store, you have the TCG, TCG version of Race, and then you have the Samuel French Acting Edition version of Race. And yes, from the consumer's perspective, they're pretty equal, right? Yeah. Which and, ours, cheaper. and ours probably yeah. sells for nine ninety five, and theirs probably sells for eighteen ninety five, or what? You know, that's. There is that aspect, because so that's the other thing you have to realize here is that we are intentionally keeping our price points at that acting edition price point, you know, which which also affects the whole dollars and cents of it, right? But what, it, I'm, what, what I'm saying is that there's no motivation for TCG to publish a trade right. edition. So, that, uh, if, if, if they so, know that the acting edition is going to be cheaper than the, than the trade right, edition, right? Absolutely. So we are we are very um, sensitive to that because we're not. This is not about us taken, uh, TCG needs to still exist. You know what I mean? They, they need to still do trade publications. One quick thing I would like to just say, of the 6,500 titles that we publish, there are trade publications for about 300 of those titles. So this does not affect the vast majority of the titles that we publish. We are often the only publication of this. And so, so again, I just wanted so it's keeping to throw alive. that out there. A absolutely. And you know, quite frankly, if, if there's a, if there's a relationship with it with a trade edition publisher we will sell their e-play on our website if the, if the trade publisher doesn't want uh, us to you know it gets in the way of our IE acting again we just want to make the content available to the consumer that's that's where we're coming from um, but yeah I mean that's it, it's a it is a it is an issue that concerns the trade publishers for sure yeah can we talk about cost? Yeah, let's talk Can about, we talk about cost. Let's Please. talk about cost. Yeah. That, seriously, because this because, is... Because uh, the, 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 the assumption is yeah. no more warehouses, I know. no more I know it's no not no paper more. and so, ink. So, so See, go ahead. there will be some creativity. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, the mythology <laughs> is <laughs> <started>. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Because you're involved. Listen, it's still not as bad as the music industry. So, the, you know. nothing's as bad as the music industry. Let's talk about cost. Uh, this, this, this mythology is sort of, uh, I call them unsubstantiated rumors, that, that, that the cost of an e play is somehow less expensive than, than producing an acting edition. And we haven't seen that to be the case so far. Now, it may prove down the road that that's the case, but so far the costs have been quite high. And there's com the, co the conversions. How so? First of all, yeah. conversions are extremely complicated. The, the idea that you can click your play and Word Perfect have it come out a perfect ebook 
is just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. It may be, yeah. it may suffice for you, but it's not going to be up to our standards. Mm -hmm. Our standards are very high. The ebook format, the EPUB format, has no provision, for example, for simultaneous dialogue. There's no provision. It has to be hand done. They didn't know what to do with it. Apple was, it, 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 totally, it really freaked them out. They didn't know how to handle it. Yeah. And in part because you have to understand it's a reflowable format. There isn't a fixed page width. So depending on your device, the, 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 the text has to be able to stretch depending on how wide the device is. So um, it's, it's much more complicated than, than it is converting, say, a novel where there's one paragraph of text. Are these things like with the, um, now in the music industry, one thing that was famous in music contracts mm -hmm. is when the industry was transitioning from cassette tapes to CDs, they insisted that in their contracts, part of the musician's royalty, they would take it, there's they're sort of a clawback on the musician's mm -hmm. royalty saying, well, you have to pay for that conversion to, from cassette to CDs, because we had to build new companies, we had to build new machines. Are you asking if we're doing that? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, it, there, there's a parallel that, that you're saying, well, there is cost, because there's a conversion cost, and I'm wondering there, there if, if once these problems are figured out, do those costs go away? No. Because there are still music contracts mm -hmm. that have that clawback for transitioning to CDs. They don't go away because the technology continues to evolve. So the catalog, the digital catalog, has to evolve with it. And we don't know where that's going yet, but I guarantee you every five years there's a revolution in technology, and we're going to have to convert all the titles we've converted already into some different format. Literally literally next month, Apple could say, mm, the file that you sent us before, it doesn't quite work right now. We need it in this new file format, or this tweaked file format. How many times have you updated WordPerfect? Yeah. So Apple needs these. So this is an incredible maintenance to keep these files current for the retailers, for whatever device. The other thing is this is a new product. This is a whole new, this is, a, we have a whole library now that we must manage. This is a whole new library to manage. Yes, the content's the same, but to keep the content the, the, the same between the, to keep the distribution, there's channels to manage, there's metadata to gather. The, the, you, you could sell a print book and you could know five things about it and you could sell it. Now, to sell an ebook, you have to have a, you have to know 25 buckets of information that gather and must be continually monitored and updated and maintained. And this is not, I mean, so it costs it, it's a same. labor. It's it costs, a la you're saying it, the costs are the same. I don't think we know. I, no, no, no. I, I'm not saying the costs are the same. No, no, wait, no, 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 be very clear. I've never said that it's not, um, for example, Right now, an average print book is about two dollars and thirty-five cents. That's that's the to, cost to create to create to create, maintain, distribute the print book. Two thirty-five. The average acting the average ebook right now is a dollar thirty-five. So yes, it's different. However, the it's not nothing. It's not nothing. There are costs. The the the, the expense to store it in a digital format is an expense. Uh, it's less of an expense than to put it on a shelf in a warehouse. But there is still an expense. Can I, two, two questions. Um, in fact, just since I said that I could do only one, um, <laughs> that first one is probably the most important. Uh, well, if, uh, when I want you to submit a new play, there's a new play that they've just written, so you don't already have it. Do they submit it to you in Word or Jeff, do you use Word or, 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 or a PDF? Oh, or yeah. do they do they change their format so it's more adaptable for you? Well, we, we get submissions uh, in all different ways. Um, sometimes uh, for the older authors, they're typewritten. And sometimes they're in, for instance, final draft format. Sometimes Word Perfect, sometimes Word. Uh, RTF, RTF, PDF. RTF, PDF, all different kinds. And what do you prefer when you well, for us, it doesn't really matter because we have to we have to typeset them first, mm -hmm. and so they go into a typesetting program like Quark or uh, Adobe uh, typesetting program, and then from from the typesetting program, then they're converted after they're typeset into the e -book. But I mean, I I know that uh, for most authors in this country, unlike in Britain, the character's name is in the middle, and then you have the stage directions under the second line. But that in the acting editions, they use the British format with the character name and what. Is the author responsible for changing that, or you just take the script as it is and you convert it? We, we that's the typesetting process. So what happens during the typesetting process is the script is submitted to us, usually in one of these formats we just discussed. It goes to our typesetter, who typeset it, typesets it according to our style guide. 
all the stage directions are set according to our style guide, unless there's some request that something, see Lori Parks, for example, help disregard mm -hmm. our entire style guide, which is fine. Um, if she creates, if somebody creates their own style guide, it's sometimes very hard to replicate that in an EPUB. That's another issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if you have, if you've written, most people will probably don't write an iambic pentameter, but if you've written uh, a verse play and your your pentameter line finishes on the next and you've got an indent, you can't do that on, on an EPUB because the screen, again, reflows. So that, there are some interesting challenges. So that, and the second question which comes from that one has to do with, with Smith and Krauss, who published um, on demand the scripts that are in rehearsal, and I think that they do that from PDFs. Mm -hmm. So they're able to do it very quickly. So my terrible question to you both is why not save costs since and, and why not print active editions that are done the same way from PDFs because they're different from the trade publications. The actors want a script and they would prefer, I know, that they would prefer the, you know, the, the regular print size with the actor's name in the middle where they can put all of their... There, there are a couple of reasons. The, the first one is that print on demand is a very expensive model. So, when you can offset print, like we're talking about print book, when you can offset print 5,000 units, you bring the cost of the book down substantially. Um, if you're printing on demand, you're talking maybe $4 per book sometimes. Also, if you use that particular format, you're adding maybe 50 more pages to the book. So that becomes more expensive as well. So it's a, it's a, co it's a cost. Because, I mean, a lot of what I said in the beginning of my assumption was that since it's electronic publishing, it should be fairly simple. You get a script here, the script is in a PDF format. There it is. We can download it. We all download scripts that we've seen in PDF format. We read them. We read novels. We read plays on our, our iPads. I don't care if I'm an actor reading it that it looks in this format. I want it to be able to be actable, which pretty much is the old-fashioned way that studio publishing or printing used to do. Mm -hmm. Studio duplicating. In the middle, there is dialogue. Um, <coughs> and I, I, it's hard, hard for me not to see that it might not really save the cost and make it faster and easier. But I understand. I mean, there, is, there is a standard. You may type your scripts very well, and you may be very organized, and it may be very clear, but that's not necessarily maybe the norm. And so th there, it is also our job to create a usable product that's in a consistent, recognizable format for our customers. But the scripts that I write, and Jeff, in that, it is in the standard format, and it is what is used when the actors do a first production. They're getting their script directly as I did it, they're printing it out, and that's what they do. Very easy for them to work from. Lots of space to add in lines, stage directions, stage management, putting stuff on the side. That's a very simple way, and you haven't been in rehearsal very often to see actors pulling their hair out trying to work from the acting edition. Interesting. Yeah, well, why, why has the acting edition evolved to what it is? You know, I mean, in terms of, it, it, I, it, I it, go it, back it, to it's how it's same. always. You know, it's probably it's, it, to do in that format is fewer pages, and exactly. so it's cheaper to right. do. Exactly. Right. But it's, yeah. not, but it's, it's not aesthetically the right. same experience. And it's not as easy to work from as an actor. Right. Right. And also, if you're talking about an ebook mm -hmm. and you have centered character tags, you have to remember that screen size is very, we don't know what the screen size is going to be. So if somebody's working on an iPhone, an iPhone? iPhone? Yeah. yeah, an iPhone where the screen is this big, <laughs> <laughs> they're going to get three character tags, and that's a page. Yeah. That's their choice. <laughs> well, I mean, that will not work very well. We have about five minutes before we start a Q&A. And, I, and I wanted Arthur to ask you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my, my renegade comment. It seems to me that this world is absolutely prepared for someone to come in with a format for active editions, mm -hmm. which inexpensively create acting editions for actors that are in the format that they're most familiar with. And it, it is possible. You've, you've chosen a format to match the format that you've been using in the past. Maybe because of the electronic, of the potential electronic publishing, you can go to a more actor-friendly and writer-friendly format, and, and that is it. But actors who only do stock and amateur will only be familiar with the DPS French 
their agents will show them that if they, they don't really do agents, well, they don't they have will agents. Move so the majority through. of people in academic and connectors don't have agents. Well, they. then they can be printed in a, in, a, in a different, you can, it's not hard for us to reformat our plays, putting characters on the left. Mm -hmm. You can do a, this, you want this version, you want the British version, or you want the American style version. And quite frankly, the way we publish now and tag certain things, it's not hard for us to redo the format because yeah. all your characters are now tagged in the character oh, field. Like, like and that. we can just move them. You want them in the center? Okay, fine. Like in the center. Like a word style sheet. It, exactly. Yeah. Like a word style sheet. Change, change so, hey, well, the next numbers. one, let's try it. I mean, I'm, we, have, we have no, we have no, you know, yeah. let's. It's, it's, you know what I think from what we're seeing here? This is the beginning of an era. It's a really crucial era. Yeah. And information and, and, and the generation of information and learning about it is the most important element because we're, we're moving into something and it's going to change the way people read, see, distribute, access. literature, access. So I think that it, it's wonderful to have this kind of discussion and in six months the discussion will be different yeah. than six more months. It's an evolving form and, and we can't it won't be fixed in stone quickly. Let me ask a hypothetical question. So I've got a, a, a two play published by DPS and these plays are not available on the on the Kindle format. And, and so and what's to keep me from reformatting them in Kindle format, piggybacking on the on the the publicity that I've gotten from your catalog selling my own Copies of my uh, 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 as those plays. So that would be your prerogative. We don't recommend it. Uh, working with Amazon is not fun. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but that would be your contract. I would say so it depends on the you know, your people, contract allows you to do that. People well, say, uh, let's say with the the you say that you're, yeah, saying that you're not distributing yeah. stuff on Kindle, and if I think, oh, well, yeah. I could. Well, I sell my, my, my books at okay, well, let's, let's That's it. That's what J.K. Rowling did. Mm -hmm. well, she did not dispose of e rights, so she. Mm -hmm. um, um, if you were to sign an e-play writer and ask us to represent the e-play rights, then it would be virtual contract. Yeah. But uh, lacking that, that would be your prerogative to do that. My understanding is that the publishers are more concerned with the licenses for the live performances than the actual sale of the individual text. That's right. Well, one, of, one of the things that I'm interested in is the idea of being able to, uh, you know, to get people interested in the scripts. You know, for instance, right. if, I write, if I write a new play, and I put it up for, for like a, a people can download it to their Kindles for a, for a buck to to see whether or not they want to put on the new play, and then subsequently after after it's been produced, there'll be a revised version, and then I'll want an acting edition. This might be a, a cheaper and easier way than my sending physical copies out or or, or individual files to various different uh, theaters. So jo Jonathan Jonathan has about two minutes before he's got to bolt out the door, and I promised him he would be able to do this. So before you go, I do want to get your your advice, and, and Tom, your advice as a lawyer, to our membership. These are people who are at varying levels of their career. Some of them, a lot of them have agents, a lot of them don't. Uh, and they're, someday, somebody's gonna send them an email or call them on the phone and say, we want your e-publishing rights, and they're, gonna, and they're gonna be in the moment. Well, and, and that's always stressful. I, what I, do I do, I would what just do I say, do? remember that nobody up here would have jobs if it weren't for you, and that it's great to be grateful, but never just sign something you get in there. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is going to be the absolute base contract uh, that is really in favor of the person giving it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, ha have the dignity that needs to come with authorship. You created something uh, where before there was nothing. And don't let it get devalued because so many people are dying to have something published. But nobody's asked them before to publish something of theirs. Well, now they have and it's time to push back <laughs> and ask <laughs> for something more favorable. I'm not saying uh, do, what, do what all of us are used to. Engage in a negotiation. Test the market. Test the market to see where you are. Because uh, you know some of these sample contracts that I think you have handouts for, I mean, they're, uh, this one on top, I, it's 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 badly drafted. I mean, twenty percent is too low. I, I don't know what this database is. I don't know how they're selling it. Uh, you know, uh, if you were, they want everything. Like there's a lot of, of. We understand you. Are, it's understood that you will get proper billing, and it's understood that you will get statements. Mm -hmm. But it's not in there. Right. 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 So, right. Uh, right. And, and and it's. I, it looks like Smith and Krause is actually. I know the name's not on here, but I think that's what it is. Uh, it's just not enough info. And something that is good here is it's not on a proportionate basis. I mean, my problem with this for my clients might be different than your problem if you're starting out. 
I don't think Edward Albee or Terrence McNally or A.R. Gurney should engage in a contract that's proportional, where there's 50 monologues. I think the ones that won Pulitzer Prizes or that have been done on Broadway should have a pro rata, you know, should be getting pro rata a little bit more because maybe they've earned it over their time and their work. That's something I find. Tom, how, how would you advise the people who aren't going to go to account and be with Flappen to, to hire an attorney? Well, I have a, one question I would have for you. Is that something that the, the Dramatist Guild offers? Do you, do you well, we have this panel to review. Yeah, we, we, the, the business of the Songwriters Guild does. Uh, well, yeah, we do contract review and we compare. And, and But since we're not a union, we can't represent individual members. Sure. Uh, what I can do is I can make notes saying, here's how the contract you were handed compares to industry standards. Now, with electronic publishing, that presents a problem. There are no industry standards to compare it to. Yeah. I, I can't make strong comments about Samuel French like, like Jonathan can because it's still blurry up in the air. I can't say, I can't say too much bad about DPS because, you know, it's the Wild West. Right. Uh, so, uh, well, look, what, what do you say to, to people? Authors, especially authors without leverage, without a strong bargaining position, those authors making bad deals is such an old story that it's actually built into the copyright law <laughs> that right. if you make a grant of rights uh, now, <coughs> it's terminable. It's not terminable for 35 years, but it's terminable. You can say, or you or your heirs, if you're not around anymore, can say, okay, publisher, we want those rights back, or else you make a new deal with us that gives us, you know, uh, a, you know, a fair return on this work that may have become very valuable and, you know, much more valuable than anybody anticipated it would be when the when the contract was made. But, you know, uh, I know that's that sort of small comfort. I, I think I would just, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, nice for your heirs, maybe, but uh, I would well, reiterate, right, though, that, that, that you know, everything is negotiable, that, uh, you know, no, you, you, you know, you can push back. You know, you may think you're, you know, you're powerless, that you have very little leverage, but you do have some leverage. They're, they're interested in publishing your work, and, and they're not going to give you their best deal off the top of the, you know, off the top. You can... I think that when we're further down the line, when we have some, when we have a history of what the deals are, we can compare ourselves to uh, to what other people have gotten. So, but right now we don't have those indices of uh, good comparison. There so are that, no objective correlatives for us. So right. Jeff, that brings up a good point. And that's the last question I wanted to ask you and Arthur. Um, there was a time when you guys were beginning playwrights, beginning authors, and uh, and you were offered contracts, and you were pressured to sign. Uh, contracts that maybe you look back on today and you say, wow, I can't believe I signed that. What what kind of, um, you know, when the phone rings in my office, I hear a lot of desperation. Mm -hmm. Some Somebody wants to publish my play. Somebody wants to produce my play. But they won't, they'll only do it if, if if I give up this these things. And I say, well, that's not standard. Well, what do I do? Well, you've got a choice. All I can say is you've got a choice to make. But I'm not an author. I don't know empirically what they've been through. You guys do. What, what would you tell them? Well, this is one of the reasons why I was interested in this panel is that I don't know what the new standards are when it comes to mm -hmm. comes to e-publishing. I don't know what to hold out for. I mean, I'm in the odd situation. Most people group their plays with one publisher or another. Uh, as it happens, some of my stuff's with French and some of my stuff's with DPS and some of my stuff's with, you know, other, other different places. And I don't, at this point, haven't figured out where it's to my advantage, to my greatest advantage, to have my stuff. I mean, this new system, it hasn't shaken out. I have a, this comparison is useful, but I didn't know, for instance, that GPS doesn't, isn't going to be distributing to Amazon until just this conversation, and that Samuel French is distributing to Amazon. Right? And that, 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 since I would like to be able to have my friends buy my scripts on Amazon, that, that may impact something. Uh, may. The, the advice I would give if you give to writers I've met um, is if you're not a member of the Dramatist Guild, join the Dramatist Guild. <laughs> because you need to go to find out, and very often our agents don't even know 
what is going on out there? Mm -hmm. What is the standard? And this is very important that, in fact, nobody knows now what the standard is. So knowledge is power. So for a writer to know there is no standard right now, and then you can come into the guild and let me know what it is. Let me try to make an informed decision. What do I do? What is possible in this? Um, for a writer having a, an offer for a play the first time, oh my God, they want me to do the play and they only want me to wash the walls once a week. And, <laughs> and, and uh, are they giving you money? No, no, no. They're, I, I, I'm going to pay for the actors to come out to me. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, what is my yeah. play? And your heart breaks because they want it done. So you need a neutral, knowledgeable source to inform you on what is there, and then you make a decision. And, and in the Guild, many years ago, when we were battling with the Lord Theaters, we had many very powerful members of the Providence Guild who got that through because they were willing to say, if you don't do this deal for all playwrights, you can't do my play. And that was very, that was amazing because the playwrights were saying, you can do my deal, but that deal has to be, I can go above it, but there has to be a standard which the drama skilled members will have. And, and it took enormous courage for playwrights to do that. So that was because they had information. Yeah. So just this, and then maybe the guild then began to publish or, or online. What is the current information? What are the comparisons between DPS and the French and, and, and Smith and Krauss? What are the disadvantages? What are the pros and cons? How is it evolving? You have to get the information. And that's and that's what it's about. And I'm hoping that one of the things that we would get is an augmented version of the handout here so that we have a, a, yeah. a greater basis of understanding, well, if I get a bid, if I have a new play and I have a bid from French and I have a bid from Travis Play Service, <laughs> aside from you know, who's offering more, uh, what different services will be attendant upon going with one or the other, and which is and which is which do I judge as to be more to my advantage with this particular play? Right now, I have got very little way to determine that. Yeah. But also, I hope that out of something like this, that it evolves for you know for for you and for DPS for all the organizations. You understand, what, and this is what playwrights want. And this is how to do it. If you want to sell the plays, you want to produce the plays, you want to help her. Nobody disputes that. This is not. You know, doing various film deals where you think I'm going to get out of here before they stick a knife in my back. <laughs> no, we love you guys. And we know that you're there and you police it and you care about theater and you do this, so it's very important. So, how to make it the best for you and you and us and everyone is we're, we're, we're feeling our way in. Right. And the other thing is, you're not working in isolation, you're in, a, 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 in, in an ecology where there are various different outfits that have to, have to coexist and they can't undercut each other right so 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 that's why I keep saying that some kinds of some kind of standard has to evolve that we can understand yeah and I do want to make clear that that um, when Arthur is talking about how the dramatist guild members discussed what the standards were at the Lord level and and um, made certain demands we're not talking about any sort of uh, Antitrust issue. What we're talking about, I mean, he's not talking. No, let me, let me say what it was. This was complete, what was so phenomenal was this was writers individually saying, I believe in the guild and I think that we should all get this. And they did it. They didn't have to do that. Right. The, 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 guild's, the guild was able to provide the information of this is a standard of behavior that we've seen in producers in the past. And if you see this changing, then you know that that's. Not to your, in, to your advantage, and you know it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, that that's you know that's sort of the more legalese version of what I'm well, saying. It's, it is actually very very important because we are not a union; we are a guild, and the guild depends upon writers believing that the strength comes from the members, and you don't have to do that. And and uh, but some people stood up and said, "This is what we believe." And, and it people, worked. Yeah, there are people who said, I would rather not have a production than to set a, than to set a precedent that screws my fellow dramas. And, and that's something that I tell uh, a lot of our very beginning writers when they have their first contract and they say, well, I think I want to do this anyway. And I don't see how it's going to affect me because maybe, you know, this is the first play and, and, and I have five more plays, you know, lined up mm -hmm. uh, to go. 
So it, it's really not going to affect me in the long term. And I always say, yeah, but it, it, might, it might affect the next author at that theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really what the Dramatist Guild tries to be about, is affecting you know, how you affect each other as a community of authors. We're going to start the Q&A. Miss? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you all so much for being here. Um, actors are loving the app Scene Partner. Um, scene Partner app, I understand that they, they can highlight their lines, they can erase their lines, they can use it for memorizing, you can speak the other person's lines to them. Actors are, shows for the Fringe are already being rehearsed with everybody using an iPad. It's, it's already here. Um, so obviously at Clyburn Park, Under Desert Cities, these, these plays, the newest plays coming out, will be available um, in those kind of editions, I assume. What about the, for want of a better word, the backlist? Mm -hmm. What about the, the plays that were published 10 years ago, The Last Trade in Nibra? Um, when will those be available for, for people who are wanting to put it on, on screen for them? Ask the author of the last <laughs> Did, uh, just I'll jump in there because it, it is very much of a pipeline um, and right now we currently have about 715 titles in the iBook store right now that you can go in. We have about another what 200, I'm sorry I'm looking at Joe who's doing it all. <laughs> uh, we have about another 300 titles in the pipeline uh, so that we will have about in the next two to three months about a, over a thousand titles available. Um, it, it, we are making no distinction between the back list and front list. We are, who's ever on board for e-publication is on board for e-publication. Doesn't happen overnight, as we've discussed. It's very much of a process. But we, we any and all, absolutely any and all. Michael, um, we're rolling them out um, because we're doing everything in house. Um, it takes some time, so yeah. So we're we're rolling them out and we're moving forwards and backwards simultaneously. And um, the, I think it bears mentioning that. Uh, last train in Nibrock is in digital format, so it's easy for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, a lot of the plays that are, say, 10 years old or older um, uh, are not in, have never been set in a computer. So we have only the film at the printer and, um, and, the, and the hard copy of, it, of the book. So those plays have to be, again, this goes to cost. Those plays have to be retyped, retypeset, reproofread, and then converted to an EPUB um, uh, and then digital rights manager, uh, management software added on top of that. So it's a, it's a, it's a process, as Ken said. This gentleman in the front. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say, I'm sure that this is already happening at the Guild, but it seems established writers, you must have started in some way a database of their negotiation processes and all the problems involved with getting this onto the internet and so forth. Because unlike a book, a poem, or an essay or something, once the script is there, it has to go out to actors, directors, designers, and so forth. Because it's not just the words, that's why it's a plot. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that the established writers at the Guild, I don't know, you probably have already done this, started thinking a database of their experiences with what they've done so far, what they think might be fair, because then it could trickle down to people, and maybe they'll be different, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, negotiation that's the idea. things. And so that that way, you've got the database that started so we can have some facts that will get to a point yeah. where there are standards. We actually have an e-publishing committee. There you go. And Arthur and Jeff are they spearheading that. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, if you um, update uh, your work, they make significant changes. Does that change the copyright date? No. Um, Interesting. Tom, Tom should be yeah. able to answer that. <laughs> the word significant is the, uh, is the key. Uh, you know, it, it would be a, a revision if it, you know, if, if you correct some typos and change a couple of words. Thing, couple but, of words. It, but if it's a scene, a whole scene, sure. then, then, then it would then, change the copyright. You could, yeah. you could register a new copyright in the new, in the new version. No, I, actually, what I wanted to say is on e-publishing. Okay. Well, e publishing really should, should, yeah. should follow it's easy it. to change on e publishing. Like, like well, one, one thing you should remember is when you copyright a play, okay, you, whatever you submitted to the Library of Congress, that's the text that's copyrighted. Any subsequent revisions and, and you are copyrighted by a second application. Well, we have to distinguish between registered copyright and common law copyright. The revisions right. are going to be have common law copyright. Right. You have protection. I, well, but it's I would, not, I but would, it doesn't change the date. Go ahead, Tom. Go. Yeah. Well, it, it's actually, no, it's not common law copyright anymore. It's copyright and copyright registration. They're two different things. 
copyright subsists in any original work of authorship from the moment it's right. fixed in a tangible medium of expression. You have a federal copyright from yeah. that moment. No, so right. if you write a, if you write a, 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 a oh my you God. Know, the there you go. Right. You write a note to your significant other. You know, I, I, I'm attending a seminar at the Dramatist Guild. Uh, I'll be home probably at 8.30. There's uh, something in the freezer. Put it in the oven. You own a copyright <laughs> from the moment you fix that in the tangible medium of the show. Generally, what you see in the book, when you see copyright 2008, copyright 2010, you have an initial copyright that was filed okay. with the Library of Congress in 2008. Revisions were made. In 2010, a second application was filed in copyright. Okay. But I, the important thing I would say to you is that, it, you know, registration is a different thing. And also copyright notice when you see copyright, you know, 2007, so and so, is pretty much an irrelevancy. Right. It really it's, doesn't it matter. It lasts for your lifetime plus 70 years. Since so we, really, it's more, it's less the date that that was written and more the date that you died. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, I just uh, I want to add a couple of things. First of all, we have copyright on those um, uh, from Abrams Artists. We put together the initial uh, comparison. Process. We got permission. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, I'm just teasing. Um, and we're going to continue to do sort of look at the other things because of distribution, there's all kinds of other factors. You know, the, the ability to pull back you know, the, the rights to a trade copy. Um, I do want to say other that um, I advise playscripts.com, the early part in terms of like, you know, that the authors know, notified as soon as a copy is sold, they know what productions are coming up, there's total transparency, you get an email. One of the things that we also talked about was the idea of manuscript copies, and they do that. You can get a copy either in a book edition or in a manuscript with those other because I thought that was a really great idea too. And I would say that in terms of the setting, of, uh, of who sets the standards, I kind of have to agree with my departed friend there that I think the authors should be, you know, setting the standards. Uh, so, sorry, guys, I don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, in the back. Um, yeah, I've been working on a graphic novel for about the last four years, or about to do one for electronic publishing. Essentially, what we're going to be doing is going to Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Uh, we're doing it ourselves. It's a poor buying thing. Um, you mentioned that going with Amazon is no thing, you know, pickling. Uh, what exactly should I know that I'm about to get into? <laughs> Either Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Well, first thing I would note is that um, the ebooks are still in their infancy. And um, I'm not sure how you're converting your graphic novel, but not to get too technical, but there's a, a file format called SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics, which is the best way to uh, publish uh, a scalable image, such as uh, a graphic novel would be. And unfortunately, um, there are, the EPUB format, while it, as a <coughs> source, supports that, the device is dead. So there are, there's so many devices out there right now, from, from the Kindle to the Kindle Fire to the iPad, to uh, the Sony Reader, to the Kobo Reader, and then there are apps which work on Android platform and work on uh, the iOS and work on the Windows uh, <coughs> Mango uh, platform. So there, there's just so many uh, uh, different devices right now. And, and that really goes to the, to the standard that you guys are talking about. It doesn't exist, but it doesn't exist because each of the device makers is trying to carve out their own niche, and 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 so while the EPUB format is uh, is a standard, how it displays on each device is different. So in other words, if we deliver it to Amazon, let's say Photoshop, or whatever, we can't just assume that they have their own format that they're going to transfer it into. We have to have the that format ahead of time, or. Well, this is a little off topic, but uh, if uh, if you're publishing images, the PDF is the best way to go. Right? Oh, PDF, you can send it to them. And this would be Barnes and all this as well. Uh, yeah, if you want that. Okay. Okay. Yes. I have um, a comment. I just wanted to say that um, as a playwright, publishing is so um, important for me because getting place produced is so hard. 
So you want your play to have a life. So publishing is a way that your play can have a life, at least in the literary world. So when I published my first play with our universe, I guess what was attractive to me is that they said it's not exclusive. You can publish with us, but you can publish with somebody else too. So I didn't feel like I was, um, someone was doing something to me that I couldn't get out of. And recently I've been asked to um, publish one of my plays with Indie Theater Now. Mm -hmm. And they're saying in six months, if you want to withdraw, yeah. you can't. And so I guess I'm feeling like, okay, it's okay to do this because there's a, a sunset clause, whatever you guys call it. No, but, that, that's exactly what that's exactly how we're approaching the ebooks. Is is we do not want anyone to be unhappy with having their tied up, having their book at Samuel Friend. We need you to be happy. We, that's what we're, our goal is. We want you to have. We want you to want to have your book with us, right? So absolutely, you can pull it at any time. You can take it out of the ePlay program. You can you can go and have you put it on. Uh, self-publishing platform as well. I mean, look, we just want, we're very confident that people come to Samuel French for a reason. We're very confident that we have our highly trafficked website and people will license the show and we can police it, we can market it, we can do all those things. We will invest, that's what we're investing in. So absolutely, more the merrier. <laughs> Is this included in the first negotiation with the first situation? Absolutely. Would you say that in when that's you're That's exactly what... I would add a qualification to that, which is if the play service, for example, were to make an offer for your play, it would include an advance. And that's why one of the reasons why we would want exclusivity is to be able to earn back the advance that we would for the property. And, and there is exclusivity in the licensing rights. Okay, so performance licensing is exclusive versus putting it on different platforms for publication. Okay, so these are these are two different, these are two very distinct things. Performance license again. If, if you're advertising, you know, if you have it on a platform, again, we may not to Michael's point, we may not recommend that that you put it on a self-publishing platform as well. First of all, we got to coordinate to make sure we got the same versions all the time. You know, we, we got to do a lot of that. Also, we can control, we can track who's bought the play, and we can police. Can you? Will you? Maybe, maybe not. You know, anyway, there's coordination. But again, we're not limiting in that. It's just we got to be smart about it too. Um, I'm very fresh. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I got my other lawyer. I don't know anything about copyright law. Um, I just uh, first I wrote a screenplay. I said, no, that's not the way to go. So I'm going to write a play. So I can go and do a play. No, this is not the way to go. I want, I want to do it in a one-man show, so I wrote a one-man. The same, same thing. But somebody wants to publish it. And I said, well, somebody said, if you sign the contract again, then you have to get permission for your uh, movie screen to be, uh, if somebody wants to do it, then you have to get permission from the publisher uh, for the movie screen, uh, as well, but for making the film as well. Uh, so I just uh, abstained uh, away from everything. Well, that, that might be something I can help you with uh, as business affair, director of business affairs, because um, it's going to be contract dependent. The industry standard is publishers will ask for the audiovisual, you know, 10% of, of the audiovisual rights a lot of times when you're getting your basic print. Is that fair to say, you guys? You want to you want to have some you want to have the ten percent of uh, the, the, the play service doesn't doesn't compare this to your right. okay and you guys ask for some, for the audiovisual subsidiaries for the play. So it's but it's negotiable it's totally some do some don't yeah so I think w what you need to do is send me the contract and I can look at it and tell you what I've seen recently publisher to publisher I can uh, we have we have every time anyone sends me a contract we keep it in the confidential membership file. So if you send me a contract from somebody, and I, I might have 50 other of those contracts with my comments and how, how that contract has evolved over time. So uh, get in touch with me. Sure. Um, okay. um, uh, Robin rice Liptick. I just signed with um, Indie Theater now, and they're publishing a bunch of my plays. And I just wanted, to, as a point of clarification, they're not publishing the plays. They're an online library. Um, I think it's very exciting. They, people go there and they can read it, but they can't download it. And they will act as the intermediary if you ask them to. I love it. Uh, if somebody inquires about 
wanting, who wants the script. And then they'll get a hold of me and I can print out that nice printed out copy that the actors will want. Except, what are, what are the chances that people are going to say, I need a play of this cast size and this genre. I think I'll go to indie theater now. Their first stop is going to be one of these publishers, DPS or Samuel French. Uh, they can read the play for a buck twenty nine on Indie Theater now and see if they really want it. It's, it's, it's getting the model in the first it's very, very interesting, interesting model. It's a I model. agree. And, it's and, 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 and they're cutting on their. I also have one piece on Indie Theater now. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just sleep with everybody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, <coughs> what, what they're carving out particularly is, is like fringe and off off Broadway stuff. So people who are looking for oh what was the what was hot in the fringe uh, in the, that may not be practical for you to do, but that, uh, you know. No, it's, it's interesting. I, well, I was hoping that this would be um, attractive to you guys. I mean, if I send you a play, right, that was done last year off Broadway and it's been on the library, because that's additional public publicity for you, right? But this, this is, this is again, so new. You know, I, I asked Morgan, is there a reason not to do it? And he said, ah, no reason not to do it. <laughs> I did it on the basis of Martin Denton's reputation. Yeah. Yeah, trust him. Look, a good play is a good play. A producible play is a producible play. That's what we ultimately want, right? We want plays that will be produced and done, and that's, you know, sure. Follow the money trail. Um, yeah, one question. In order to contact you, do we need to have an agent and a contract and a production schedule, or can we just contact you and saying this is a good play? <laughs> Great question. Um, in terms of submissions and acquisitions, um, it it um, we re highly recommend a play has had a production or has had legs. It's going to go through a development process. It's going to change. It's going to find its way. It's it's going to evolve. Yes. It's um, we, we do have certain and and you can talk to me afterwards and I can give you some information. We do have certain. Um, Contests and festivals and those kind of things that you know we accept on un, produced work. Uh, again, we can always send it to us, but the fact of the matter is, the, the more um, development it's had, the 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 more it's going to stand out and be something that we can actually get, go with. That's right. Michael, DPS submission guidelines. Uh, we accept unsolicited submissions, but I agree with Ken. Uh, your focus uh, as playwright should be on getting a definitive production of your play. That's really the focus and. Um, usually we'll find you. We're looking. <laughs> you go on community as life fringes and golf ball We go everywhere. We, 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 we do. We have time for one more? One more. Yeah. Or did we get or them all? Or do we have anything from online? We so? don't actually. Oh, good. Great. Thank you all very much. <laughs> thank I'd like to thank yeah. our panel. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Terry. If you didn't sign in with me,